Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Matthew Fleming. I anchor the site reliability team at New Relic. I'm Elisa Bennett, and I manage the reliability engineering and internal monitoring teams at New Relic. Uh, we're here today to talk to you about SLIs and SLOs in the real world. And I'm sure that the idea of SLIs and SLOs being a critical part of a complex, um, high-functioning SRE and reliability practice isn't uh, news to anybody here today. However, trying to figure out when you're running a real live, in production, complex software platform, what to measure and how to measure it can be really difficult. So today we're going to talk about some concrete examples of how to define and measure SLIs and SLOs in the context of a complex software architecture. And we believe these will be really useful templates that you can take back and apply to your own environment. Now, one quick disclaimer, we both work at New Relic. And since we drink our own champagne, yay, and we monitor our own platform with New Relic, you're going to see some New Relic screenshots. Uh, that's just the example we're using today. However, we feel like the principles that we're, we're sharing will apply pretty universally, regardless of the tools that you're using. Absolutely. All right, so just a quick check to make sure we're all using acronyms the same way. SLIs are uh, the key measurement of your availability. SLOs are the goals that you have for the availability of your system. And then SLAs are the legal thing that happens if you don't meet your service level objectives. So in today's talk, we're going to talk, we're going to discuss both SLIs and SLOs, but we'll primarily focus on SLIs because until you have service level indicators, you don't have a place to begin measuring your service level objectives. Makes sense. So, uh, Elisa, for example, uh, our SLI, SLO, and SLA right now might be. 10 key takeaways in 20 minutes, 99.9% .9 of the time. Or we'll mail you a Wookiee? Yes, we will send people Wookiees. We have Wookiees? We do. I can come up with some Wookiees. Uh, OK, we'll go with that. Um, so uh, for this talk, we're going to use the example of a SaaS monitoring platform um, that's based on a very simplified version of the new Relic platform. Very simplified. And you know, we want to start with sort of a common sense plain English description of what it means for this system to be available. And in this case, we might say the system's available if uh, we're collecting data from customers properly and customers can log in and view their data. So now that we've got that high level description, um, it's time to dive in and start implementing some points of measurement so we can understand how we're doing against our goals and where our hotspots are, right? But under the covers, uh, a platform like this that has a lot of complexity. We have DBs, we have LBs, we have message buses, we have service nodes. Uh, it's a ton of stuff. So, so where do we start? Um, well, to answer that question, we need to introduce another piece of terminology, which is the idea of a system boundary. Um, so this is actually uh, what was referred to earlier by uh, Dave Rezin from Google as an application. But um, a system boundary is where one or more components expose one or more capabilities to external customers. So here, we've got the example of a login service, which exposes an API representing the capability to authenticate a set of user credentials. Now, internally, this service, this system might have a bunch of moving parts, right? We might have a bunch of service nodes, you might have a DB and maybe a read replica, maybe a load balancer, but those don't represent system boundaries because we're not exposing like the DB itself or a service node itself mm -hmm. to external customers. Instead, it's this group of components that act in concert as a whole to expose those capabilities to external customers, which can be other systems or engineering groups in this organization or real external customers like the end user. Makes sense. Okay, so using this idea of system boundaries, we can now group the components of this platform into logical units, um, each one of which exposes one or more capabilities. And in most organizations, including at New Relic, these system boundaries tend to line up pretty well with team boundaries, which makes it easier to draw this kind of map. Um, and of course, we have one more system boundary, which is the boundary between this product as a whole and the external customers, our end users. And it's at this point of system boundaries that we're going to focus most on our SLIs and SLOs because these boundary SLIs and SLOs are the most highly leveraged. They're useful to the most people. Um, they're useful to the engineers maintaining the system. Yep. They're useful to customers yep. who rely on that system. And they're useful to the larger engineering organization. So, you know, if I'm an engineer working on a team maintaining a service, yeah, I, I care a lot about things like how my databases are performing. 
But if I'm a customer using a system, I, I really don't care how often the underlying DB is failed over as long as the system as a whole remains available, right? What I care about is stuff like how much caching and retry logic and resilience do I need to build around this dependency? And that's the information that the boundary SLI and SLO gives me. And that same information, again, is really useful to the larger engineering organization as we're talking about things like roadmaps and investment levels. Okay, so having defined the terms, the basic recipe we're gonna follow here is pretty simple. Um, first of all, we're going to uh, identify the system boundaries that exist in the platform. We're going to articulate the set of capabilities that exist at each system boundary and a plain English definition of what it means for each capability to be available. Then we're going to define SLIs for corresponding to each definition of availability. We're gonna to start to measure them and get a baseline. Um, once we've got a baseline, we're going to apply an SLO, and then we're gonna iterate and refine over time. Sounds like a plan? Makes sense, sounds like a great recipe to follow. All right, let's dive in. All right. Uh, so now that we have our system boundaries defined, let's, dive, let's start digging in. So going back to our original definition of availability for our overall platform, one of the uh, important parts of availability is being able to actually um, properly collect customer data. And so that's going to be one of the key things that we measure when we talk about availability of our data ingest tier. So what this tier does is it accepts, it accepts incoming data from customers and then it sends it to the right place for other systems to consume it. So breaking this down, we have two key capabilities, data ingest and data routing, and we'll have at least one SLI for each of these capabilities. Makes sense. Okay. So for data ingest, we want to be able to say that like X percent of uh, <clears throat> well-formed queries or well-formed, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> well-formed payloads are accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we might be able to determine that by monitoring the number of payloads that return a 200 response. Uh, now, since this is an async, non-transactional endpoint, we don't really care about the response latency. For data routing, however, uh, we want to be able to measure that some Y percent of messages are available on the message bus to be read within some Z seconds. So for that, we do actually care about latency, and we can measure this by uh, looking at the data ingest timestamp and comparing it to the time that that message was actually available on the bus to be read. So we have an SLO for each of these capabilities, but we worry less about the SLI's SLO than we do about the SLI itself because SLOs are actually pretty easy to adjust over time. Now you may notice that you don't, we don't have any uh, traffic or load thresholds defined in these SLI's or SLOs. Oh, geez, yeah. Yeah, yeah, really scary if you're an engineer. However, um, in practice, your workload is a moving target, so if you define static thresholds, or if you define your SLIs and SLOs based on static thresholds, they're just going to become out of date virtually immediately. Okay, so I did say that SLOs are easy to change. That doesn't mean that you should just pick any number at random. A thousand percent. No, that's too high. One percent? <laughs> that's too low. Okay. okay, so there's a few things you should consider when you're uh, defining what your SLO targets are. SLOs need to be based in technical realities. They need to be a number that the team can actually commit to supporting. If your SLO is consistently missed, it's terrible for morale, and it sets a false expectation of the availability of your system for other teams that are dependent on your system. Mm -hmm. uh, SLOs should be used as a tool to create organizational alignment. You can't have a, a major disagreement between your organizational leadership and the engineers about what those SLOs should be. Your SLIs and your SLOs are, an are a commitment by both the organization and your engineering teams to invest in the reliability work needed over time to defend those SLOs as your workload changes. Um, speaking of change, expect that your SLOs can change over time. For example, if you have a less mature system, you might want to start with a lower number and then over time adjust that and increase it. Um, so again, Make sure that you define and measure first before you set your SLO objectives. Measure first, I'm gonna hold on yeah. to that one. Okay. That. Um, okay, so after data ingest, one of the next key things that happens in this platform is it gets stored in uh, one of our main data tiers, which at New Relic is a proprietary database um, called NRDB. 
And going back to our top level description of availability, customers being able to you know, log in and view their data, in other words, query it out of the DB and produce it in a UI is you know, a key aspect of availability. So it's that query capability we're gonna focus on here. So under the hood, NRDB is a really complex system. We have thousands of nodes, many different worker types, and under the hood, we're gonna care a lot about things like you know, GC time and memory usage and data durability and event scan per second. But at the level of the system boundary, we can actually just look at query response times and error rates as broad proxies for all of these categories of underlying behavior. So we're gonna end up defining two SLIs, one around query response time and one around error rate. So when we think about defining an SLI for response time, we're obviously not gonna look at the average response time because averages lie. Um, but we're also, yeah, but we're also not gonna look at like the 99.9th percent because those are our sick, weird, pathological cases. Um, instead, we're gonna generally focus between like the 95th and 99th percentile. And we're instrumenting our queries so we can, we can just slide around the percentile that we look at um, after the fact if we need to. But we're gonna start with the 99th percentile because that gives us insight into a very broad range of uh, user experiences while not focusing too much on the extreme outliers. And now that we've defined the SLI, here's kind of a cool trick. We're going to configure an alert condition to trigger if we violate that SLI. Now, we don't necessarily wanna wake somebody up for this. Um, we, might, we might set a less sensitive threshold for actually getting someone out of bed. But now what we can do is we can just look at the percent of time when we were in violation of this alert condition and we have a very easy way to calculate our SLO performance. And then we're basically gonna rinse and repeat and do the same thing for, for error rate. And this is kind of boring, but. Boring is good in this case. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll take this kind of boring. So um, now we can articulate a couple of SLOs for this system or alternately, we can express these things as a single compound SLO that captures multiple conditions. And the benefit here is that it might be a lot easier for customers to reason about one compound SLO than multiple independent ones. Um, so if you do this, the, the trick around calculating SLO becomes looking at how much of the time is the system satisfying all of its SLIs. In other words, we and them logically together. All right, so in addition to our new data tier, we do still have some legacy systems that are hard charged. Same. <laughs> yes, we're really working hard to get rid of cases like these, but we do need to include them and have SLIs and SLOs for them now because they're part of our production platform. Uh, so in a lot of respects, the way we think about these legacy systems is very similar to the way that we think about our new horizontally scaled data tier. Uh, the specifics are gonna be slightly different, but basically they're conceptually still the same. Now the one difference is that we're going to actually have to measure SLIs and SLOs on a, separately for each shard. And that's because due to the hard sharding, the user's workload is not spread across the shards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a very important difference between uh, SLIs for horizontally scaled systems and those that are hard sharded. So in a horizontally scaled system, if you lose one out of three nodes, that means that you're seeing a 33% error rate as a result, and you can anticipate that your user queries are still going to have two thirds of their requests handled. Now, in a hard sharded system, when you lose one out of three nodes, uh, statistically, that's still 33%. However, what's really happening is uh, some of your customers are seeing a 100% error rate, while other customers are seeing a 0% error rate. Difference. So there's a really big difference between a third of your customers being completely down and all of your customers being degraded. Uh, so we measure SLIs and SLOs separately for each logical uh, instance of a system, in this case, for each shard. Makes sense. Okay, so um, we've defined SLOs for a lot of pieces of our platform, um, but we haven't actually tackled some of the toughest SLIs and SLOs yet, which are the ones for our infrastructure components specifically things like our networking and our container scheduler and runtime cluster where all of this stuff is actually hosted. And these are some of the hardest SLIs and SLOs to define um, and also the most important. Most important because they're hard dependencies for everything else. Hardest because, you know, like the network or the, the compute layer, like, you know, they're like the force, they're everywhere. They surround the us, they bind us. us. <laughs> right, so the key here ends up being, again, 
figuring out how to express distinct capabilities that these tiers offer that we can specifically measure. And if we're in doubt about what those capabilities are, one weird trick you can use is talk to people, right? We get together people from engineering teams and we ask them questions like, what do you use the network for? Or what sorts of guarantees would you like to see from the network? And out of that, um, we look for common patterns that can inform our understanding of those capabilities. So in this case, it turns out there are basically three capabilities we care about for the networking tier. Um, uh, load balanced endpoint availability, routing within an availability zone, and routing with, across AZs. And we're going to define an SLI for each of those. And although we know we can adjust our SLO later, we also know we're going to need a higher SLO here than for the services running on this network. Um, because our experience is you lose about half an order of magnitude to a full order of magnitude of availability for each infrastructure tier. So if we're looking for three nines out of the services running on this network, four nines is probably a reasonable ballpark to start here. Um, next thing we need to look at is our container scheduler and runtime system. And basically what we want out of this thing is we want the ability to run a job with the set of resources we requested when we request it. Um, so that's cool. Simple, right? Yeah. Um, devil's in the details, though. So um, how are we going to measure this? Well, first, we need to think about resource starvation. Now, in this cluster, we're using hard quotas um, and process isolation to formally allocate memory and CPU. So that starvation should never happen. Um, but we do need to worry about uh, network resource starvation. So that's going to be the thing that we focus on measuring by looking at link saturation on the actual hosts and say, okay, well, periods of time when a host is actually saturated, we're going to subtract from the availability of that host. Similarly, when we look at the uptime of jobs running in this, we don't actually care about problems introduced by code in the job. What we care about is downtime introduced by the cluster itself. And so the key here is to look at the job lifecycle. We're using Mesos and Marathon. And if we look at the actual job states, we see there are some job states representing jobs that have been scheduled but not yet started, and others that represent error conditions in the cluster. So that's going to be what we focus on when we talk about our downtime. OK, so now we finally have SLIs and SLOs for each of our components of our system. Um, so uh, it's awesome because it's going to actually help prioritize, uh, help teams prioritize the reliability work. And it's also going to help us to identify hot spots that may need more investment in reliability. Um, but we still need to implement one more SLI and SLO combo, and that is for the customer-facing availability of our overall product. And that's the sanity check to make sure that our components are working together in a reasonable way. Now, for this check, we can implement a simple synthetic script that uh, is a simple end-to-end -end workflow. It sends a piece of data to the platform, then logs in and queries that data to make sure that it's available. And if we see a significant discrepancy between the performance of that script and our overall SLO performance for our systems, then we know we'll need to revisit our SLI methodology. OK, so it's worth noting that uh, the mo for most part, we've been talking about the average customer experience of the system, which gives a good statistical sense of how our product is performing overall for customers in general. However, it's not unusual for your business to say, we want to give good availability for some customers, but we want to give really good availability for some key customers. And so in practice, this means actually setting an SLI and SLO for those key customers. Um, now, you, ideally, you can query <laughs> in your existing monitoring data for, your, uh, for uh, this data if you're tagging with your, or querying with your user ID, or if you're uh, tagging your analytics events, you can look at it this way. Or you can run a synthetic script, checking to make sure that you're getting that customer data uh, and that you can actually read it. Yep. Um, there. All right. So <laughs> let's recap real quick. All right. Worry about SLIs more than SLOs. Uh, start with plain English descriptions of availability, not technical underpinnings. Define SLIs and SLOs for components at system boundaries. Uh, each logical instance of a system, like each hard shard, might need its own SLI and SLO. SLIs are not the same as alerts. Mm -hmm. um, you can and together your SLIs to create a compound SLO. And write down your SLI and SLO contracts and share them. Not a secret. Not a right. secret. Um, key customers might need their own SLIs and SLOs. Assume your SLOs and SLIs will evolve over time. And remember that SLOs represent an ongoing commitment. All right, did we meet our SLI? 
I do not think we did oh, from the look at that no, sign. Okay, okay. <laughs> we tried. All right. Well, that means you get a Wookiee, and you get a Wookiee, and you, you get, get a Wookiee. Wookie. We're out of time. So if you have any questions, please come see us at the reception uh, after. And uh, please also DM us if you'd like to reclaim your Wookiee. Thank you so thanks much. Thanks, everybody.